Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 146, which reads as follows. Konuhaso kimmanando nichang panjalite sati andhakare na onadha padipang na gavesata which means Konuhaso kimanando what is this what is this laughter wherefore the joy nichang panjalite sati when when there's fire everywhere when there is flames there's always flames nichang constant flame burning there when there is constant burning andakari na onanda for one who is shrouded by darkness padipang nagavesata for those you, know, you you who are shrouded by darkness you don't seek out a light a lamp padipa This is another memorable story of the Buddha. There's two versions of it. There's the reasonable Jataka version, and then there's the, some might say, over-the-top uh, Dhammapada version. So I'm not really sure which one to, uh, to focus on. The, the, the Dhammapada version is quite uh, entertaining, but I think some people would argue it's not perhaps as accurate as the Jataka version. What they have in common is um, it's about the companions of Visaka. Visaka, who was a great Buddhist lay disciple, a Sotapanna, who um, would never engage in any impropriety. And so she had these friends. And Visaka was in an interesting position because she was married to a man who wasn't Buddhist. Uh, there's a long story about about that. Uh, basically, those times marriage was was often about securing connections between wealthy families, and so she became a part of that. But because she was so humble, she didn't even she she didn't even uh, argue, or, or she didn't didn't. Uh, She didn't, she didn't uh, get upset about it at all. Uh, but then she had great trouble and was, was uh, ended up getting in, in a real fight with her stepfather, you know, her father-in-law, her husband's father. Um, he got very angry at her. It's a long story. It's not our story here. Uh, but the story we have here is of some of her friends who, in this environment, were perhaps, well, were clearly not so inclined towards purity and goodness. Maybe they weren't such terrible people, but they were perhaps misled. And all of their husbands um, got together on a drinking festival and got really roaring, stinking drunk. But the wives, of course, they had to well, they had to do all the preparations and they weren't allowed to get drunk. Now, the Dhammapada story says that they got drunk anyway. Um, went with, they convinced Visaka to take them into the, this pleasure garden and they got drunk. They, where they could be away from the eyes of their husbands and uh, they took strong drink, it says, and, and Visaka asked them, you know, what are you going to do? And your husbands are going to be all upset. If you go home, they'll know you're drunk. And sure enough, when they got back, their husbands beat, beat them all. And they didn't learn. This is the Dhammapada story. The Jataka story doesn't have any of this. It comes a bit later. But then they, 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 they still wanted to get drunk. And uh, so they asked Visaka, they say, hey, let's go to the garden again. And she said, no, no, I'm not, I'm not having anything to do with you anymore. 
And they said, well then take us to... She said, I, she said, I you know, for me I'm Buddhist and I follow the Buddhist teaching. And strong drink is something that destroys your mindfulness. That's what's important about this story for us as meditators. And they said, well then take us to see the Buddha. There's anything to get them out of the house, right? But they, so she took them to see the Buddha and they snuck alcohol jugs under their, under their dresses, under their cloaks. And so they all showed up at the, 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 the monastery of the Buddha. It would have been Jetavana. Or been to India. It's a beautiful place. And uh, so they sat down and the Buddha started preaching and they smuggled the alcohol out and they all got drunk. And uh, so the Buddha started, the Buddha was preaching, but they couldn't hear the tipping, <laughs> tipping back and forth. And then they started, you know, they got it in their heads that they would start dancing. And so they all got up and started dancing in front of the Buddha. And then uh, the Dhammapada story says, again, this is where it gets a little bit exaggerated maybe, but it says there, there was a, a Mara angel, a, a, a deity of the Mara realms, the evil, the mischievous realms, who decided it would be a good idea to get these, uh, these women to act really impro improper, and so she sort of uh, possessed them or something and got them all to strip off their clothes and dance around naked in front of the Buddha. Quite a sight. And so both stories make clear that the Buddha set f sent forth some sort of uh, special magical power, uh, some, some projection of color, of, of very dark rays of, of not lightness, but rays of darkness, or dark blue light or something. And it uh, frightened them. He, he shocked them back into sobriety somehow. And then he taught this verse. Why are you laughing? Wherefore, wherefore the, the joy? When there is constant flame, it's, it's burning constantly. The world, the commentary says he's referring, he says the word, the world is burning actually. So it sounds, I, I, I think, for the ordinary listener, it sounds uh, kind of exciting. I imagine for the meditators, it might there might be a twin, a, a twinge, or you call a, a slight uh, thought of oh, dancing and singing, and maybe even alcohol. I suppose if you've started meditating, alcohol is is uh, less and less appealing as you start to see how messed up your mind already is without alcohol. But dancing and singing, they seem like wonderful things. It's exciting, right? It uh, releases all sorts of pleasant chemicals in the brain and makes you feel lots of pleasure. We don't see the fire. Intoxication, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting topic. You know, alcohol is something that intoxicates you. We should talk about this because it's an issue in meditation practice, uh, you know, the living of your life. What are the things that are going to support your practice? What are the things that are going to hinder it? Alcohol is one of the things that's a, it's the antithesis, antithesis of meditation. It's the opposite. And meditation is about clearing your mind, or trying to cultivate the habit of seeing things clearly as they are, and, and alcohol is for the explicit purpose of dulling and and muddling things, so that you can't see things, and so that you, your your ordinary reactions to things are are dulled, and as a result, you never have, feel any pain or any suffering. You're just able to do whatever you want, 
cultivate whatever bad habits you like, you get angry and there's no consequences because you're not aware of them. And that's really the thing about alcohol is it, it, it uh, blinds you to the nature of your actions. I've told this story before, but there was one night, I remember explicitly, I mean, I, I used to get drunk and, and, and thinking back, I don't suppose I did a lot of terrible things, but there was one night that I remember explicitly, I was just, fell in with the wrong crowd and uh, um, ended up going around stealing other people's alcohol and, and waking people up and bothering people in the middle of the night. and getting into all sorts of trouble and ended up getting in, in seriously damaging friendships as a result. I mean, there's so many results, so many stories of the results of alcohol. Uh, abuse comes from alcohol, uh, violence of all sorts. Of course, uh, sexual promiscuity comes, unwanted pregnancies, I imagine. But it cultivates all sorts of terrible bad habits. It sets, it allows your mind the freedom to be as evil as you want. You could be good under alcohol, I suppose. It's possible that under alcohol you could be quite nice to people. There are times, you know, you know, the the happy drunk who sits there and says, "I love you, man," that kind of thing. You could argue there's some wholesomeness going on there. Yeah, there's a lot of delusion and unwholesomeness as well. But it, it, it prevents you from being able to see clearly. It's the very essence of what it does. And it allows that, so, so first of all, that, that's something we have to be clear about, that things like drinking alcohol, most drugs as well, are, are highly problematic for meditation practice. Marijuana, I think, is, is a, an obvious one. It just makes things too distorted. Uh, people who do marijuana might argue I've done it before. I was never really did a lot of marijuana for a time. Problematic. It doesn't allow you to have a clear mind and to see things clearly as they are. As men, these things are marijuana and alcohol in, in general are meant to dull things, are meant to, to bring positive states only and allow you, free you from the need to experience the harshness of reality because reality become, can be quite harsh and if you're not well trained and sharp as a diamond it will cut you. So the, fir the first part, the other part is that it allows us to talk about the, another kind of intoxication it's the intoxication of, of, the or, of ordinary people, the intoxication that's present in all of us at all times. Not at all times, but throughout our lives, regardless of what we're taking into our bodies, it's coming from our own minds. Just the chemicals in the brain, this is enough to intoxicate anyone. In Buddhism, the, the Buddha mentions, I think, four types of intoxication, or three types of intoxication. Intoxication with youth, intoxication with uh, health, and intoxication with life. Can't remember if there's a fourth, but so you, young people, young people are intoxicated with youth. That's what leads us to do far more alcohol, drugs, and alcohol than we than uh, well. To, to do far more than we would otherwise. We're young, right? In teenage years, some people never grow out of it, but when we're young, we're inclined to do all sorts of crazy things, thinking well, we're never going to die and there'll be no consequence. It's unfortunate because this, there's so much potential and that's what you get intoxicated by. Infinite potential. And so do whatever you want no consequences, but there are consequences. That's the unfortunate part is when we're young, that's when we have the power. The Buddha said, this practice is not for old people. You, know, you have all these Buddhists nowadays and even in the Buddhist time saying, oh, when 
when I get old, then I'll practice. You know, you know, when I'm when I'm retired, right? It was a thing in in the Buddha's time. Even old men would go off into the forest and tend to the flame. It was about all they were good for: is pouring butter on a flame. It was a religious practice. Forget about meditation. Some old people can be very good meditators. It's not to say, but the Buddha said, you know. This is a hard practice. If you've spent your life engaged in unwholesomeness, it gets more and more difficult. It's not to disparage people who are older who practice, but it's to wake up those people who are intoxicated with youth and think, oh, I've got lots of time. Sure, you have lots of time, but lots of time spent doing, cultivating un unwholesome habits is... It's just setting yourself up for disaster. You know, when you come around to do meditation, you've built up all these bad habits, and you're no longer in a state to be able to meditate. We're intoxicated with health. If you're healthy, fit, healthy and fit, thinking illness will never come to me. Mm -hmm. And get intoxicated by it. It doesn't really matter whether we don't have to talk about getting old or getting sick. Of course, that's the, the reality of it, right? You could get sick at any time and you're going to get old and youth will not last forever. But more to the point is just being attached and, and becoming intoxicated with your, with your, your youth and your health. Healthy people get so wrapped up in materialism, right? Exercising, running, dancing, singing, right? You see these women dancing and singing, enjoying their bodies. So much that they became intoxicated. It's interesting because this is what you start to see in meditation, that reality is quite a bit harsher than we think it is. And so you have two options. You can spend your time intoxicating yourself, either with external substances or just with the chemicals in your brain, you know, find ways to find pleasure again and again, it's intoxicating. It blinds you to the reality. You feel pain, you feel stress, go off and take your drug, shoot up in the brain. And, uh, and it's, it's repressed for a while. Of course it gets worse the next time it comes and worse and worse until you become a drug addict whether it's external drugs or brain drugs, it's all the same. And then eventually it's compounded by the fact that you do get old and you do get sick, and then you're totally unprepared for death, and you wind up a real mess. Or reborn as a dog or a pig or something. Really, who knows when your mind is not clear. The third intoxication is intoxication, uh, intoxicated by life, intoxication with life. I'm alive, carpe diem, seize the day. The stupidest thing in the world, this precious thing called life, right? This precious life. And then you say, yeah, so let's do whatever we can to mess it up because we're going to die tomorrow, right? We could die any time. Well, it makes sense if there's nothing after. If there's nothing after life, then... No, it doesn't even make sense then. This is what I've talked about, is that even if we were to die and, and never be reborn again, it would make no sense to intoxicate yourself further. And that's what we don't get. That's what you start to see in meditation. Meditation seems so stressful. Wouldn't it be nicer if we danced? When I was in Florida, someone was talking about uh, laughter yoga or something, laughing yoga. I don't know, as a Buddhist you sometimes have to bite your tongue with all these spiritual practices. Arguably some of them are, are positive, but I think they get a little bit indulgent. Wouldn't it be better if I taught you all how to laugh and solve your problems by laughing? Sounds more fun. But that's what meditation shows you. Meditation, insight meditation shows you something different. 
shows you the nature of reality, shows you your experience. Oops. And it teaches you to overcome your intoxication. So recently, um, right, so the so meditation shows you that. shows you that life is not, or, or the, the indulgence, intoxication, it's not actually happiness, right? When you're meditating, you can see all of your impurities, we'd call them, but let's think of them as our, our attachments, our desires. And you're able to reflect um, objectively on them. And as you experience them, and you experience the things that you want and the wanting of it, you can feel the stress. You can see how it's actually stressful. It's like a dog, a hungry dog who sees a, a bone smeared with blood and thinks, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll satiate my hunger with that bone. Gnawing on the bone and can gnaw on the bone forever and will never be satisfied. We'll always have this gnawing, stressful feeling of hunger. That's what you start to see in the meditation. And then, of course, the fact that there is life after death just compounds that, because people who die when they're on... There was a story recently of someone who, uh, who fell off a roof. They were on acid and LSD and fell off a roof. Could you imagine what that would be like to die when you're when you're on drugs? Death can come at any time. So that's the verse. That brings us to the verse. The verse has some interesting aspects. So why laughter? Why exaltation? This is the this is this. Here, there's a better translation. Here's the fun translation from the Jataka. You can all remember this. Because it rhymes. No place for laughter here, no room for joy. The flames of passion suffering worlds destroy. The flames of passion suffering worlds destroy. Why overwhelmed and why overwhelmed in darkest night I pray, seek ye no torch to light you on your way. It's a good a good question for all of us, not just these intoxicated women, all of us living in the world chasing after useless things, distracting ourselves until catastrophe until tragedy strikes and then it's too late, we're unable to deal with it. We're untrained, unprepared for it. Meanwhile, we live our lives content with mediocrity, with, with stressful lives, with interspersed with bits of happiness. We don't see the flames. We see only the light. It, ooh, pretty pretty light. We don't see the burning. The Buddha gave a whole sutta, a whole discourse on burning. I won't go into it here, but we have the flames of defilement, the flames of suffering, the flames of old age, sickness and death. There are consequences and there are problematic, uh, problematic uh, something problematic about craving and clinging and desire. That's what we start to learn in meditation. That's what you should be able to see as you stay here, as you continue to practice. We're in darkness means we're in delusion. This is what intoxication does to you. This is what our desires and our attachments do. They 
blind us to what's really going on. They blind us to the present moment and the here and now. So mindfulness is this torch, the Buddha's teaching, but, but more specifically mindfulness. Mindfulness is this light that you shine in and it, it clears up all the darkness immediately. Right? There's a wonderful thing about mindfulness practice. You don't have to actually cultivate it. You can start right now. You can, you can apply it right now. At any moment when, it, when you wake up and you say, what am I going to do? Be mindful at that moment. So this is what you're cultivating. This is what we're working on here, is this ability to manifest the presence of mind that keeps us here and now, it keeps us aware, alert, awake, it keeps us sober. So there you go, there's our Dhammapada first for this evening on intoxication. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all the best.